Black and Gold by Emmanuel Gollier. January 15, 1919, 10.25 p.m. The Paris-Barcelona Express rushed through the darkness. The storm above was about to burst. The clouds were spared by the sporadic flashes of lightning while deafening bursts of thunder filled the horizon. In the berth of a first-class compartment, a man was vainly trying to sleep. His excitement was too great and he could not keep his eyes from constantly returning to his briefcase. It was at long last in his possession. It, the precious document he had finally succeeded in acquiring. It was of course encoded. But he had bribed a corrupt officer of the French Deuxième Bureau and now possessed the key to the cipher used by the Black Corsair. Once again, the man had reviewed the events of the past few days. In particular, the suspicious behavior of two guests who had suddenly arrived at the hotel where he had been staying and seemed to be spying on him. Some of the staff too had seemed much too inquisitive. He had wondered if he was becoming paranoid. Still, he felt like he had made the right decision by leaving suddenly without notifying anyone. There was too much at stake. He had left Spain on the first express train to Paris. Outside, the storm finally burst and heavy drops of water began to fall on the sleeping car in a deluge. Soothed by the sound of the rain and the rhythm of the train, the man finally fell asleep. January 16th, 2.15 a.m. Suddenly, the man woke up. The rain had stopped. The air should have felt lighter, purer, but it was quite the opposite. The man felt sick, his chest burned. He was finding it difficult to breathe, and his eyes were tearing. Seized by panic, he rushed to his briefcase, opened it, and pulled out a yellow sheet of paper covered with figures. The line seemed blurred. He staggered backward and fell back onto his berth. The pains in his chest increased. He felt that if he lay down, he might be able to breathe easier, but no. Everything grew dark. His hands dropped a precious document for which he had given so much. Seconds later, he was unconscious. The same day, 9.50 a.m., two men were sharing a copious continental breakfast in a plus residential house on Rue Nocuti in Paris, 14th arrondissement. They both shared a singular Anglin profile, but one of them had gold speckled eyes with an equivalent of a hawk. His hair was short cut and his face was devoid of facial hair. His companion, however, looked more bohemian and sported a handlebar mustache. The man with the gold and speckled eyes was Leon Saint Clair, the prodigious explorer known as the Nectalope, because of his uncanny ability to see in complete darkness. His guest was his biographer, the popular novelist Jean de la Hire. They both remained silent, enjoying the warm coffee, the buttered tartines, the croissants and jam that had been laid out before them by Corsette, the Nyctalope's butler. Breakfast was not a time for talking, but for communing with food. Twenty minutes later, comfortably installed in their leather armchairs, they finally began to discuss their business. I had a meeting with Ferran Chassi, said Lahir. He's thrilled at the idea of publishing my novelization of our Martian expedition, but I'm still waiting for the contract, but I think the book might come out as early as next year. That is good news, Jean, replied Leon gravely. This publication is important to me. I want the public to learn that the benefits of our French civilization have now been exported to other celestial bodies. I plan to return to Mars someday, but there's still much to be done there. Then, after a pause, weren't you supposed to introduce me to two of your colleagues? Yes, Captain Cezal and a young writer named Alexandre Zorka. They should be here soon. Just then, Corset entered and said, Sorry to disturb you, monsieur, but monsieur le president is here and asks to see you at once. The Nectalope stood up and offered his hand to Jean de la Hire. My dear Jean, I'm sorry to cut this meeting short, but pressing matters of state demand my attention. I have to meet your friends another time. Lahir nodded. Yes, of course. I know they very much want to make your acquaintance. I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. 
As Lahir stepped out of the salon, he politely saluted the president, the Sensei, who was rushing in. A grave expression of concern painted his aristocratic face. Monsieur Valenlay, how can I be of service to France? said the Nictalope modestly. Monsieur Sinclair, my car is waiting. You must come with me. It's a matter of the greatest urgency. I will brief you in detail on route. Ten thirty a.m. A biting, icy wind was blowing through the halls of the Austerlitz railway station on Paris' left bank. An entire platform had been cordoned off by the police. Leon noticed the Paris-Barcelona Express had stopped here. At the sight of Monsieur Valenier and Leon Sinclair, the gendarmes saluted and let the two men through. Has Dr. Yersin arrived yet? asked Valenlay. Though Nictalope was acquaintance with Alexander Yersin, the French physician from the Institut Pasteur, who in 1895 had discovered the bacille responsible for the dreaded bubonic plague and prepared the first serum. He had met him in a hospital in Hanoi during one of his journeys to the Far East. I thought Dr. Nyarset was in Indochina, he remarked. Luckily for us, he was here on his regular visits to the Institute, replied Van Den Lai. He is examining the body, answered the gendarme, who the president had first addressed. It's through there. The nectarlope and the politician stepped into the sleeping car. They quickly reached the compartment where Dr. Nyarset was completing his examination of the dead man. He turned around when he saw the two men. Monsieur Sinclair. He said, recognizing the first of the brave young explorer with pleasure. What a surprise! Monsieur Sinclair had agreed to help us with our investigation, said Valenlay. There can be no better choice, Monsieur le Président, replied the scientist. In non train, the natives call him Sun King, the mountain spirit. Is this the case of the Spanish flu, doctor? inquired Leo. No, Monsieur Sinclair. This is the most devastating case of pneumonia plague I've come across. This poor man was dead in their hours. Then, more furtively, he added, as Monsieur Valenglet will collaborate, there has been a small epidemic in Europe in recent months, which is why the Institute has requested me to return to Paris, he added. In order to avoid a panic, we must not told the public and have instead blamed the deaths on influenza. I see, said Leo, then turning toward Valenglet. He said, I'm not a doctor, Monsieur le Président. What can I do? Valenlay coughed, took a gumdrop from a box in his pocket, then replied, Today's case is somewhat different, Monsieur Sinclair, and right down your alley, if I may put it that way. You certainly remember a certain Leo de Malter, a.k.a. the Black Corsair, who, in 1912, stole a prototype submarine of revolutionary design from a military. That wasn't the first time such a thing happened. The wretch Dupin did the same in 1902, but unlike him, the Maltaire declared war upon society because some ill-understood grievances. To further his anachronistic ambitions, he had assembled a vast criminal organization that trafficked with another similarly notorious villains from across the globe. I remember that all quite well, Monsieur Valenlay. A matter of fact, I played a modest part in the man's downfall. Yes, of course, said the politician. Then will you recall that eventually an armistice of sorts was reached with Merter and all his men were pardoned. Recently, they all have begun to die, one by one, from this very strain of Palamori plague. That is... odd. But for the first time, we appear to have a clue, said Dr. Gersin. I found this page written in some kind of code amongst the dead man's effects. In his hand, he held a yellow sheet of paper which the dead man had dropped before succumbing to his fatal disease. Then Nictalope took the document and studied it with attention, and then he frowned as if a thought had struck him. His eyes looked beyond the platform with its squadron of uniformed men and focused on the shadow-shrouded rail yard meant for storing, sorting, loading and unloading cars next to the station. Do you have the anti-plague serum with you? He asked the doctor. Of course. I need an injection, said Nictalope as he pulled up his sleeve. Later that day, 3, 7 p.m. The room was brightly lit by an array of electric lights. Everything in it was made of gold. The table, the chairs, the man's side safe presently ajar, revealing its dazzling contents. A collection of gold coins from various eras. Doubloons, tellers, accus, even the artwork hanging on the wall was made of painted gold. 
In its center was a solid gold statue of a man, struck in a visionary pose, pointing at the horizon as if heralding the dawn of a better day. Next to the statue, sitting in a gold armchair, was a man lost in reverie, contemplating dark thoughts known only to him. It was in fact the man portrayed in the statue, Dr. Fiston. Dr. Fiston had only one overriding obsession, gold. A promising biologist, he had been recruited by the Black Corsair and worked on a deadly strain of plague for which the Maltaire had traded with an energetic Asian mastermind known in some parts of the world as Dr. Natas. During this brief encounter with Natas on behalf of the Black Corsair, Fistern had learned that the scientist held another secret. He could make gold. But Natas' secret had been handed over to Maltaire himself on a carefully encrypted sheet of paper. For seven years, despite the turmoil of the Great War, Fistern had labored on distangling the careful network of associates of the Black Corsair had gathered around him. One by one, he had hunted these men in the hopes of finally getting his hand on the secret formula that would make him the gold maker, the king of the world. He used Natas' deadly bacille to kill all those who opposed him or thwarted him, or even threatened to expose him. In doing so, the innocent had also perished. But as the saying goes, it's all about the omelets, not the eggs. And finally, the formula had been found. The man from Barcelona had it in his possession, but he had been disposed of. Man had been sent to fetch it and should be back in any minute. The bell rang. Fistern carefully looked through the spy hole. It was his two acolytes. The same man who the now dead agent would have recognized as the two guests checking in the hotel in Barcelona late at night. Pressing on a hidden button in his chair, he let them in. Once they were in his sanctum, he asked, Do you have it? The taller of the two men looked afraid and finally muttered, Uh, no. The Nictalope took it. Fistern blanched. What happened? We followed our instructions to the letter. We checked in in this hotel, bribed the staff, and slipped the bacille into his food. But he left suddenly, and we missed him at the station. We were forced to take the train after his. Uh, by the time we got to the guard de Australich, he was already dead, and the police had cordoned off the platform. So we hid in the train yard and kept watch. A doctor arrived, then the President du Corsail with the Nictalope. I recognized him at once because I've seen his picture in the newspaper. Uh, he took the document and left. And where were you when you were watching all this? Asked Fistern, suddenly seized by a horrific prisonment. Safe in the darkest portion of the rail yard. Fools! shouted the scientist. Don't you know that? Darkness does not exist for the Nictalope, concluded a strong voice from the other side of the room. The three men turned around and saw the Nictalope, smiling, pointing a browning at them. Shoot him! screamed Fistern. He can't get us all before we kill him! As the two gangsters grabbed their guns, the Nictalope shot out an electric array. The room was immediately plunged into total darkness. I wouldn't bet on it, said the Nictalope. In the dark, the Nictalope saw Fistern pull a test tube from his breast pocket. I've just been vaccinated by Dr. Yassin, he said. It won't work. Fistern recognized the name of the great French scientist who had vanquished the horror of the plague and with a gesture of defeat placed a test tube on the table. Resurrender, he said, beaten. That evening, 7.30 p.m., Leo had just finished dressing for an evening at the opera. After straightening his white tie, he grabbed his hat, then the invitation. I am impatient to see Ida sung by that new diva, he thought. She'll definitely become the next toast of Paris. What's her name already? Ah yes, Laurent Spiley. This was a narration by Bonsert Bokel for the Retro Future Research Foundation of Black and Gold by Emmanuel Gourlier. Translated by Jean-Marc Lofichet. From the anthology by Jean de la Hire, Enter the Nictalope. If you want to support us, please consider checking us out on Subscribestar or support our upcoming publications of the Association of Ishtar, which was partly inspired by La Hire's hero, the Nictalope. Links are in the description.